All right, great. Welcome, everybody. Today we're talking about business planning. Sounds like a lot of fun, but the topic, one of the topics that we're going to spend a lot of a, a lot of time on is something that is probably of interest to you, I would hope, is on, well, how do you generate business? Right? That's sort of the that's sort of the, the point of it. And we're going to go through some different models for doing that. There's a um, a folder that we shared on Tuesday. Do we have a link for that that we could paste into the chat? Should I find it uh, elsewhere? Done. It's done. Thank you, Angela. Welcome. We knew that was coming because I mean, so what we're going to start with um, a discussion of putting a plan together, and then we're going to get into some more details. And the, let me see if I can share now. How about this? Okay. How about here? So I wanted to cover a few things and we're going to look at, there's some forms, some different copies of them. Um, I'm going to explain what the differences are. Let me see if I can make this too much stuff on my screen. Let me, uh... there we go. I guess everybody can see that. Yes. Okay. My screen looks crazy. So it's hard to tell. Um, the National Association of Realtors have recently, like in the last few weeks or so, uh, re released their profile of home buyers and sellers. It's published in 2024. It's about what happened in 2023. Right. We won't know what happened in 2024 until 2025, but it's something that's useful for us to look at, and usually something I go through when I'm talking about business planning. Now, if this is may not be the easiest to read, I had to deal with what I had. I didn't have a chance to make them bigger. That's what I did. Anyhow, so they asked um, buyers and sellers, how did you find your agent? An important question. Right. And for buyers, the number one way in which the buyers found their agent 40 percent of the time was they were referred by or is a friend, a neighbor or relative. Forty percent of the time, by the way, first time home buyers, it was 51 percent of the time. Right. Over half of all the first time home buyers found their agent through sphere of influence. This should give us a clue as to where we want to focus our efforts. They'd used the agent before 17% of the time, inquired about a specific property 7% of the time, went to a website, don't remember which one, 6% of the time, referred by another real estate agent or broker. So if you're in EXP, you have access to this huge referral organization, workplace, they post things, hey, I'm looking for an agent in San Diego, that I'm looking for somebody in Sacramento, and that accounts for 7% of all the buyers. Saw so a for sale or open house sign 5% of the time. One way to get buyers is to get listings. Because if you have listings, you're going to get buyers because the buyers are interested in the listings. Went to an open house 5% of the time. So if there's a hundred buyers that come through an open house, five of them are going to pick an agent from going to open houses. Hmm? That There's a message there too. Personal contact by the agent for relocation two, and it goes down, 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 down. How many, you know, this isn't in 2024, so we don't know what it's going to look like with the, you know, changes from the NAR settlement. But in 2023, 75% um, of all buyers only talk to one agent. 75%. Right? Only one out of four interviewed agents 
Um, it's uh, um, anyhow, uh, repeat buyers, it was even higher because they probably knew the agent. First time buyers might talk to more than one, but most of the time the buyers are only talking to one agent. How about sellers? How do sellers find the listing agent 38% of the time, 38%. Percent of the time they were referred by or is a friend, neighbor, or relative. 38% of the time. Use the agent before. 28% of the time. Website for. Referred by another agent or broker. 4%. Personal contact by agent. 4% of the time. But still, it's 4% of the time. Direct mail, i.e. farming, 2% of the time. And it goes down from there. Notice social media isn't a, a very high percentage. Um, how many agents did the typical seller interview before the seller uh, picked one? 81% of the seller said they only talked to one agent. 81%. So working your sphere of influence, doing open houses, maybe prospecting for buyers and sellers. And if you're the first one, once they've made the decision they want to do something, you're the next agent that they talk to, chances are you're going to end up working with them. Um, the goal of this, creating a business plan, and the reason why we look at, well, what are we going to do next year and the year after and the year after, as you progress through becoming a really good real estate agent, you go through different levels. Now, if you're a new agent, you're just the foundation, just learning where stuff is and how to use it, how to use the MLS, how to use RPR, how to use zip forms. I mean, just, you know, basic stuff, right? Um, how to fill out the forms, maybe. But what we want to do is to create a pipeline. We know that 70% of real estate transactions do not come from our first conversation with somebody, but comes from future conversations or following up, 70%. There's a saying that the fortune is in the follow-up. That's where the money is really made, which requires a pipeline, which generally speaking requires a computer system, a software program. And the easier, the more flexible, the more efficient and effective that software program is, the more business you're going to get. Remember the percentages of, 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 of agents that are picked because they know the person. Right. Now, once you've got a pipeline and you've been feeding it and you've got people in it, then the next stage is momentum. And this is where people start calling you. I can remember the first time this happened. I was a little shocked. I get a phone call. And it's some guy says, hey, Mike, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing really good. This is, oh, yeah, how are you doing? Well, you sold us a house a few years ago. And we've decided to move into something bigger. When can you come over and put our house on the market? And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> I'll be right over Tuesday. Yeah, all right, we'll see you then. When we'll tell you what we're looking for. And I was like, wow, that was easy. Right, because I had already, I, I'm now getting repeat, I have momentum, right? I'm getting repeat business, I'm getting referral business. The people in my pipeline that I've been following up with are now doing things. The market got a little bit better. There was a big burst and I'm, and I'm riding the tide, right? Momentum. Now, at that point, you need leverage and leverage means help. Right, you need it, it. You don't want to be bogged down in all the details. You might need other agents to help you. You might. You're going to need help, which we're going to talk a little bit about, in order to just maintain, so you don't just burn out. And the proficiency, the mastery, is at the top. Now, just a couple more general concepts, and we're going to get into some specifics. I've got spreadsheets for those who like them. There are, generally speaking, four ways real estate agents make money. They prospect, they network, they market, or they convert internet leads. Those are the four ways. And although some agents gravitate towards one, if you said to me, well, what would be, I need to get going, I'm serious, I want to make a lot of money in real estate, which of these four should I do? And the answer is all of them. All of them. 
most of the business comes from networking, but enough of the business comes from the other ways that you want to do it. And partly the decision about what you're going to do in order to generate business. Now, remember, real estate is very simple in that all you have to do is learn how to talk to people about buying, selling, or investing in real estate. That's all you have to do. We can help you with the rest, but you have to talk to people. And the methods that you could use to talk to people, some are fast, some are slow, some are free, some involve an expense. So for example, um, quick and free, door knocking, open houses, for sale by owners, expired, foreclosures, relocation. Now that last group, for sale by owners, expired, foreclosures and relocation, that assumes that you are manually, let's drop relocation for a second, for sale by owners, expired and foreclosures. You have software if you are a member of the Board of Realtors and the MLS, that would allow you to uncover who those people are. There is other software you could pay for that would skip trace or look up to get their contact information and you could call them yourself. And that doesn't cost a lot, right? You understand emailing them, finding their phone numbers that are online, that's a relatively free, or you could buy a service that gives you all of that information so you could just call them scrubbed for the do not call list dialer all of that sort of stuff right which we'll talk about later there are some things that you could pay you could get a zip code on zillow you could do pay-per-click advertising you can purchase databases that's what i was referring before it speeds it up now slow sometimes has a bigger effect over time. SOI is sphere of influence, social media, YouTube videos, all of those things are things that you could do that don't cost very much of any money. But then there are some paid things you could do that are a little bit slower, but they will produce, they will produce results in time. And, and so part of the, what can I, what, what will be on my plan? Because if you don't know where we're going with this, is I'm going to be asking you all to pick out what things you're planning on doing. And then you're going to give us the list and we're going to post it on uh, our face. No, 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 right. Forget that part. Right. Forget that part. Um, how about this? So this is something that comes from place, which is called the lead generation model. You'll see a lot of similarities. And the sphere here is, by sphere I mean right now the circle. Some things are what we would expect agents to be doing at first, which is working their sphere of influence, well, duh. Doing open houses, because then you have the opportunity to build rapport with people you do not know face-to-face. -face prospecting the for sale by owners, the circle prospecting, the expired listings, the distressed sales, all of the tools and systems that you would need to do those things are covered in the place model by the team. And once you've kicked in to that group, which by the way, should be producing one to two deals a month, in California, in some of our areas, people could cut the number in half because our price point is double. But let's say one transaction a month would come from the left-hand side of the wheel, the sphere, open houses, and prospecting. And then the team would be providing internet leads, listing leads, and other leads to match, that's the goal, your one transaction a month with another transaction a month to basically double your production. Now, the if you Google searched real estate one-page business plan, you're going to find results. And you're going to find, if you keep digging into it, that this particular system goes by many different names. It's sometimes called a 135. It's sometimes called a GPS. It's sometimes called an ETA. 
And as you can see in this, this version of it, it's called the GPA. It's all very simple. And of the all of that, you know, alphabet soup, a one, three, five is the most descriptive. And so what we are, we're going to do first is we're going to build a one-page business plan. A one-page business plan. Now, what it is, the one, three, five, is the one is, do you have one big business goal? And you can have more than one, one, three, five. I have a whole bunch. So let's say for your real estate business, you had a goal, and the goal was to do 12 transactions in 2025, just as an example. It might be 24, might be 36. I'm not trying to set a ceiling for you. But let's say your goal in business was to close 12 transactions in 2025. Not too bad. That's the one. Then there would be three major priorities for you to achieve that goal. What would that look like? Well, number one, how about seller? So if you're going to do 12 transactions, how many of them or what percent or both would you want to come from people that are selling their homes from listings? Let's say half. Why not? Right? So you want six people that want to sell their home who eventually sold it. Right? Um, what would be a, another priority? Buyers. So if you're wanting to close 12 transactions and six of them are going to be sellers, six of them are going to be buyers. So that would be our second priority. And the third priority would be the product. And what are the fundamental concepts about planning in real estate and success in real estate is just understanding what you're doing. And if I ask, I've done this in, in live classes many times, got a lot of weird answers sometimes, but I would ask a group of people, what business are you in? And people would say, well, I'm in the, say, I'm in the marketing business, I'm in customer service business, I'm in the real estate business, and none of those are the right answer. You're in sales. I'm sorry if this hasn't hit you before, but you're in sales. And if you're in sales, the question then, is, I mean, it says on your license, salesperson, right? I mean, you know, let's just go with that. So if you're in sales, the next question is, what is it that you sell? And it's not real estate. I understand sellers sell real estate, buyers buy real estate. That's not what real estate agents sell. What real estate agents sell is a package of services that would help buyers, sellers, and investors achieve their goals in buying, selling, and investing. That's the product you you're the product. Your package of services is the product that you're selling. How good is it? How good is your package? How effective are you at explaining to somebody what your package of services is and why they would want it? Huh? Huh? So we would focus on buyers, we'd focus on sellers, and we would focus on ourselves to make our value proposition more valuable. One, three, five. So for each of the major priorities, we would have a maximum of five strategies, right? Five different strategies. Um, let me see, what am I? Oh, why didn't it go? Oh, I don't know. So I have given you a copy, which I'll circle back to in a second, of a form that you could print out. But this is not a complicated form. I've had people like, oh my God, I, I, you know, I need the form. I mean, the form, you, you write one thing at the top, you write three things underneath it. Then after you've done that, you write the three things again, but this time putting in maximum of five things underneath each one. This isn't a complicated form. And so in place, we've integrated this whole concept into the technology platform that we use so that your business planning 
can actually be translated into the operating system of your business, into the customer relationship management, into the tracking system, into the marketing system, into all the other systems can all be integrated together. But if you're like, well, I haven't joined place yet and I don't have access to Brivity, which is the software that they're using, I don't know. Um, well, great, I, you, there's a PDF. <laughs> there's a PDF. Right, which I'll show you, but it looks pretty much the same. So notice priority number one was they wanted, and this is just an example, they they wanted to do a certain number of uh, transactions. I don't know how many, I guess this is sort of looking back on a past goal, but let's say priority number one was to get six sales from listings. That would be priority number one. What, what what could we do? What would be five things that we could do that would allow us to find listings? So number one, it could be our sphere of influence. Remember, the reason I showed you that list is you might want to go through the list of how sellers found their agent, just as an example, right, for what you're going to target. So one thing that you would do to get listings is you would contact your sphere of influence. What else could you do to find listings? You could do open houses. Certain percentage of the sellers found their agent by visiting open houses. What else could you do? Well, you could call for sale by owners. You could call expired listings. You could use predictive analytics, which are software programs that identify people likely to sell. You could, um, what else? distress sales. You could look for pre-foreclosure properties. You could look for people that are getting divorced, people, probates, people that, have, you get the idea, right? But we're not going to do them all at once. The goal is to pick out five. You could do a geographic farm. For those that aren't keeping up with this, some of the examples of the five ways in which you could find a seller is fear of influence, open houses, cold calling, we could just throw that together, geographic farming, right? Or you could even throw in community events, networking events that you go and attend because you get to meet people that are in your community. Does everybody get it? We're going to say, I want so many sellers in 2025, and here are the things I'm going to do to get them. Let me know if, um, Angela will let me know if somebody texts that I need to respond to or yell at me. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Does that make sense, everybody? Now, I'll give it a pause. At some point, we might want to fine tune this to say, well, my geographic farming is going to be so many. My, my sphere of influence is going to be so many. But right now, we could just get away with these are the five things we're going to do. Maximum of five doesn't have to be five. What about buyers? Well, if I want 12 transactions and six of them are sellers, then six of them are buyers. What are the five things I'm going to do? Now, there can be an overlap sphere of influence. Right? It was where most of the buyers found their agent. Open houses. Open houses are good. Buyers and sellers go to open houses. Right? You could be doing home buying seminars. You could do community educational events. You could be doing pay-per-click advertising. You could be pushing out properties and social media where people click. You could have landing pages and squeeze pages and internet lead generation and all that stuff, right? But we're going to pick maximum of five things you're going to do to find buyers. And by the way, for many agents, sphere of influence in open houses is 80% of their business. But if you have high goals, you're going to want to find the other 20%. So what's the third thing? Um, what is the third thing is the product. Well, what could you do to be a better you in real estate? For example, could you get enrolled in a ongoing script practice role playing so that you know what to say? Because the secret of real estate is knowing what to say and then saying it to enough people. It's really that simple. How good is your script? How good do you have an elevator script? Could you, if somebody says, so how's the real estate market? Do you have an answer? Other than, oh, it's weird. We don't know. It's going up and down. 
Why do you ask? All right. So if you were going to say, what can I do to be a better real estate agent? Number one, you could learn what to say and practice saying it. You, How's your listing presentation? Hmm? How, how is it? How good is it if you were competing? How about your buyer consultation? How good is that? All right. Have you practiced? Do you have an opportunity to do that? So we're doing scripts. We're doing presentations. What else might we want to do? Well, do you know the market? Do you study the MLS? Do you preview properties? Do you go to open houses so you know what's going on in your real Do you know the market? Market knowledge is something that helps, especially new agents, overcome experienced agents because they know what's going on. You can look for referrals. Everybody see where I'm going with this, right? One goal, how many transactions do you want to do in 2025? Three priorities, how many buyers, how many sellers, and what are you going to do to be a better value proposition? And then up to five general categories, strategies under each one of those three. Any questions about that? You'll see in the folder there's blank forms, simple forms, you know, it's not a complicated idea. Now, for those of you, I, I, had, I had considered showing you what my mind map thing looks like, but some of you might you know, think I, I, I need better medication. But there's this 1355. A 1355. So let's say one is the 12 transactions. The three first one is I want to get six listings. First one is an open house. First of the five strategies. Well, what are my five strategies for working open houses? Well, number one, I have to find them. How do you do that? Well, you can go to the message boards and say, hey, I'm available to do an open house. You can look for people saying anyone want to do an open house. You can set up an MLS search from anyone from your brokerage, list the home in the area you want. It will send you an email in 15 minutes and you could contact the listing agent and say, hey, do you need any help with open houses? You could be flexible and not just do the open houses on the weekend, but do them during the week as well, particularly if they're vacant, why not? You understand? So we would be of a, doing an open house, we would have five strategies. One is how do we find them? Number two, how do we prepare? What are the different things that we ought to be doing before we do an open house? If you're wondering, I have some, I have some suggestions. For example, you ought to go preview all the other properties that are for sale in that area that are competing. You ought to look and see if they're having open houses. You ought to run a market analysis on your property. You ought to know what the average sales price is, days on market. You ought to know what's going on in the neighborhood. You ought to do research. You ought to know who the schools are and what their rankings are. What's another strategy for an open house? Well, now you're at the open house. What is your plan then? Does everybody see that the more of this we can substructure, just outline, flow, we start to end up with a list of very specific tasks that need to be done. Okay. I can see you're all excited. The 80-20 rule, also known as Pareto's principle. Pareto was an Italian economist who also was a gardener. Yeah. And he had noticed, he was researching the distribution of wealth in Italy. This was a long time ago. Uh, but what he found was is that 20% of the people had 80% of the wealth. Now it's, what, 2% of the people have 98% of the wealth. But anyhow, we'll let that go. So we're going to keep with the 80-20 rule. And he also noticed that his garden, the pea pods, the 20% of his pea pods produced 80% of his peas. And then he started looking for the 80-20 rule. Where was that ratio? Where did it show up? And it doesn't show up all the time. Right? Don't send me examples where it doesn't show up. The 80-20 rule is imperfect. Right? It's only accurate 80% of the time. 20% of the time, it's not even accurate. And, anyhow. So 20%, what does this mean towards what he's talking about? It means that of all the things that real estate agents can do, should do, ought to do, must do, 
20% of those things translate into 80% of your income. And the other 80% translates directly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, be careful. Hello? Okay. Uh-oh. I can't see the... Um, who's talking? I can't see the guest while I'm in the slideshow. Well, we'll see if it keeps going. Maybe, Angela, can you mute people? Michael, um, can we zoom in on the um, on the presentation? I... I have been told that when I'm doing it this way, it's already zoomed in. I can't see what you see. So I don't know what it looks like. We could see like the next slide in your notes. Well, then I didn't know that. So let me um, thank you for saying something. Um, thank you for saying something. Somebody else is unmuted, though. All right, that's something else. That, uh, that looks better. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't realize because I thought that when I, I got that. Yeah. Sorry, I thought the two slides was part of your strategic planning. No, <laughs> it's that I can't tell once I click on what you can see. I can't tell it. It disappears. So I'm just you know winging it. Um, anyhow. So have we muted everybody? Let me just make sure. Uh, I did not know that. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, so of all the things that a real estate agent could do, should do, ought to do, 20% um, of the things produce 80% of the income. This is somewhat counterintuitive in that if I do eight things and you do two things, which of us is ahead? Well, the answer is it depends on the eight that I do and the two that you do, All right? There's a difference between being busy and being productive. I can't believe I was, anyhow. Um, this is a issue in my experience that many people have in many businesses, but particularly in real estate. And it takes a long time for many real estate agents to understand the nature of how business works and this principle and how it applies to them. And, and let's think of a metaphor. So I'm a doctor, I have a doctor's office, and I wanna make as much money as possible being a doctor. And so I'm looking at the other doctors and, I, and I'm looking for all the ways they waste money. Do you know how doctors waste money? Well, some of them waste money because they, they pay for a receptionist, right? They pay to have somebody just sit in the front and talk to people when they walk in and answer the phones and type into the computer. I can do that, right? I, I can do that. I'm a good typist, right? I, so I, as a doctor, I've decided I'm going to sit at the front desk too. And I'm going to sign people in. And then when I have to do something, I'll just put up a little sign that says, you know, we'll be back in a minute. The other thing that doctors do that seems like a huge waste is they hire nurses, right? They hire the nurses and the nurses weigh people and the nurses take blood pressure and all that other. I can do that. I can weigh people. Scales aren't that complicated. I can take blood pressure. You see, I'm going to make the most money possible as a doctor because I'm not going to hire anyone to help me and I'm going to do everything myself. Now, some of you may have already noticed that there is a flaw in that thinking. And the flaw in the thinking is that all that other stuff you're doing is worth a lot less than being a doctor. And in fact, it occurred to me that the way to define whether or not what you're doing is the 20% that is valuable, ask yourself this question, do I need a license to do this? You see, the doctor doesn't, you don't need to have a doctor's license to be a receptionist. You don't need a doctor's license to input into the insurance portal. You don't need a doctor's license to weigh people. You don't need a doctor's license to do a lot of the things, but you need a doctor's license to do the diagnosis and the prescriptions and all that. So think about real estate agents. Because what real estate agents sometimes say is, I'm going to do everything. 
right? I'm going to, I'm going to manage, I'm going to be the transaction coordinator, right? I'm going to take a course on God knows what, right? I want to learn about 1031 exchanges. I'm going to know every, do I, do you have any investors? No, but I just figure it'd be good to learn, right? You know? I'm going to study the MLS. I'm going to make my own flyers. I'm going to go to each picture. I'm going to take my own pictures. I'm going to put up the for sale sign, right? You know, I'm going to do everything um, because then I don't have as many expenses and I'll make more money, right? And the answer is no, because you're doing $20 an hour or even less work and expecting to make $250,000 a year. That doesn't happen. So in determining what 20% as a real estate agent is what you ought to be doing, in order to determine that, ask yourself a question, does this task require a real estate license? Well, ask yourself that question. Does this require a real estate license? And the answer is no. If the answer is no, then it's probably not your 20%. So what things, what activities do real estate agents do that require a real estate license, talking to buyers, sellers, and investors about buying, selling, and investing, right? It says in the Business and Professions Code in Section 101 of the list of things that require a real estate license, it says soliciting buyers or sellers of real estate. That requires a license. It says negotiating contracts with buyers and sellers. How about showing property? That requires a real estate license. So what would be the core group of things that real estate agents need to do is talk to people about buying, selling, or investing, making consultations, having appointments with people, Negotiate writing contracts, negotiating contracts, showing property. And whenever you're doing something that's not on that list, you might ask your question, should I really be doing that? <laughs> Unlicensed, you know, un maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Does that idea make sense? And so I can remember when I worked elsewhere, if I were doing something and it wasn't, you know, um, like putting flyers in an envelope, someone might stop and say, is that your 20%? Really? Is that it? Right. Um, I didn't know. Now it's gone. So this is also sometimes referred to as the big rocks. I don't know if you've ever heard that metaphor. I hope that that's showing up on the screen. <laughs> I yeah, hope. we can see it. It looks okay. good. Um, I have to figure out how I can see what's on the screen when I'm doing this. Uh, so what the big rocks are, and, and if you Google, you'll see videos on it. It's kind of fun. They have these this great big beaker. And next to it is a pile of big rocks, a pile of smaller rocks, a pile of even smaller rocks, a pile of sand, and a pitcher of water. And the goal is to get all the stuff that's on the table into the big cylinder. And there's only one way it works. And the way it works is you have to put the big rocks in first. And then once you put in the big rocks, you can put in the smaller rocks and then the even smaller rocks and eventually the sand and then pour water. It's the only way that it works. And so what the 80-20 rule tells us is that we want to make sure that we're doing the big rocks first. Um, what is your 20%? So this is something for you to think about. But your priorities, you know, what would be like for priority priority number one, right? So a given sphere of influence, right? That was a priority for um, or even the the let's say working with sellers, number one is sphere of influence. What would be your 20% in working with the sphere of influence? Another way of defining this is the who question. All right, so I want to work my sphere of influence. What do I need to do? Well, number one, I need to get everybody that I know into one database and put the database in a customer relationship management system. Do you have to do that? 
Is that a thing that requires a real estate license requires you to do, or is there a possibility you could get some help? Um, particularly, you might export things out of your phone and other things, but somebody else could put it into the database. Good thing. Right. Number two, you might want to call everybody that's in your database at least once a quarter, maybe make an initial call once you kick this off. That's a you thing. All right. That would be part of your 20% because now you're calling people to talk to them about buying, selling and investing. Hopefully that's a licensed activity. What else could you do? Well, we ought to send them a market analysis that shows what's going on in the market in their area. Do you have to do that? Do you have to figure out what the average price is, days on market and all that other kind of stuff? Or could there be somebody else that could do that for you? Well, you have to write emails and things like that that keep them, you know, what events are happening and what's going on. And do you have to do that? Or could you get somebody that would do that for you? Well, we ought to find them on social media and we ought to post things on social media so that they realize I'm in real estate. But again, is that something that you have to do? Does everybody see where I'm going with this? We're, we're dividing out the things that we have to do because those are licensed things. And we've got the license versus the things we can get other people to do. And for each of the things, open houses and sphere of influence, all of that, we're looking for leverage. And leverage means people or technology that can help us do this. Um, all right. So we've done the 135. Now what? In order to make this, I don't know. If fun is the right word, now I have to find the, uh, give me a second. Are there any questions why I find the next thing? Yes, no. Yes or no. All right. So don't talk to me. It's okay. Michael Pine, you can always count on Michael Pine. Yes, quick question. So if someone, obviously, um, with your experience, you know off the top of your head what is and isn't a licensed activity. But if somebody was going through their business plan and trying to determine um, what it is that they could outsource or what it is that they could do themselves, uh, how would they go about determining what's licensed activity? Section 101, Business and Professions Code, Article 1, lists about eight things, most of them are not relevant to us, that require a real estate license, eight. One of them, number one, it says soliciting buyers or sellers of real estate. Now, the Department of Real Estate has argued back and forth, what does that mean? Could you hire a telemarketer to call for sale by owners for you? The answer is yes. And when somebody says, I'm interested, they could connect them to you, but you would have to be the one that would be talking to them once they've identified that they're interested. Because the telemarketer, unless they have a real estate license, can't do that. Soliciting buyers or sellers, right? So calling for sale by owners, you could hire somebody, but most of the agents oftentimes do it. At a certain point, we might hire an ISA. Negotiating contract is also part of that of, of that part one. So it says soliciting buyers or sellers or negotiating contracts to buy or sell real estate. So writing the offer, right? Negotiating. So how much do you want to offer? Well, we really don't know. Well, I'll find some comps for you. Let's go over the comps. Oh, those look like that might be good for us to offer about that much. What contingency should we have? Well, why don't we do this? But we could waive that. You see, all of that stuff, that's licensed activity. Calling the listing agent and saying, hey, I have a client who's interested in making an offer on your property. We're probably going to come in a little under list prices. Want to know how your client's going to feel about that. That's licensed activity. Right, that's the negotiation of the contracts. Right, meeting somebody on a listing appointment and a buyer consultation is licensed activity. Showing property is licensed activity. That's about it. 
<laughs> you know, even when you're in escrow, most of the things that happen in escrow can be done by transaction coordinators and processors. And sometimes agents don't get involved unless something's go wrong. Right. Or in terms of communication, but even in terms of communicating with the client and telling them what's happening and where we are, that's not licensed activity. That's not on the business and profession code list. Mm -hmm. So your goal would be to spend all your time doing that. As much as possible, like, how about this? Since I'm sticking with the 80-20 rule. 80% of your time ought to be spent doing the 20%. So when people, ask, people, I mean agents, ask me about creating a business plan, one of the first questions is, how much time do you have available to devote to real estate? How much time? How many hours a week? Now, some say 40, some say 60. Let's go with 20. Right? Let's go with 20. Well, if you don't have a bunch of clients, and you have 20 hours that you can invest in real estate every week, 80% of your time ought to be spent doing that 20%. And since you don't have anyone to show property to, and you're not writing offers yet because you don't have anyone to show property to, what we're talking about is the soliciting of buyers and sellers. 80% of your time. And if you took a 20-hour week, and you multiplied it by 80%, it's about 16 hours. When you divide it by five, five days a week, and you round down, it's three hours a day. If you spend three hours a day, five days a week, right, that would be 15 hours a week. That would be less than 80% of a 20-hour work week. How many people could you talk to in three hours if you had lists and you were calling? And the answer is probably 20, right? Sphere of influence and others, you could talk to 20 people a day, five days a week on three hours a week. Now your, your, your allocation of time is going to change because once people are clients, you're going to be spending time negotiating contracts and showing property and doing other things. But at the beginning, that ought to be your goal, 80% of your time. And once you get busy, 50% of your time should still be spent on that core group and generating business. Because generating business is like breathing. It's something you're supposed to do often. I think so. Was that helpful? I don't know. Thank you. So ETA is another version of the GPS or the GPA or the 135. It's something you can, I, it's, a, it's a PDF. So let's say we've done it, right? We've got our one, our three, our fives. We got even fives on some of our fives. We have this list of all the things we need to do. Now what? Well, now we have to, to move to a well, actual business plan. And so this accountability form about targets and activities is also sometimes known as a 411. Um, it's really a 114, but eh, let's let, I'll show you what I mean by a 114 annual expectation. Now, we could have more than one thing here, but just to keep it consistent with what we've been doing, 12 transactions. How about that? Right. 12 transactions. We could be adding other things to this, like developing, um, you know, opening in, in another market, uh, farming in a given area. We, we could have other annual goals, but let's just go with 12 transactions. So monthly tasks, let's say we're doing this, we're, fitting, we're, we're tweaking all this in December, we're going to hit January running. So our monthly tasks for January 2025, and what we're going to do is we're going to, from our 135, identify what tasks would need to be done in January. Well, let's say January, um, and by the way, you added, we, could, we, we could do December. The 12 months doesn't have to start. Let's do December because I want people to move. And there's a lot people that work in November and December, by people I mean agents, get business in January and February. But let's say December, one of our monthly tasks is I'm going to get my sphere of influence together. 
All right, get it all together, get everything in one place, go through, make sure it is in the software program. Number one, that's what I'm going to do, all right? That's a monthly task. What would be another monthly task? Well, I, I need to have my buyer, my buyer consultation isn't that good. You know, I'm fumbling when I get, to, you know, sign this form that says you're going to pay me hard. I, I, I need to master or become proficient at the buyer representation. That could be a monthly task. Listing person, that could be a monthly task. I'm going to start a geographic farm in this neighborhood. That could be a monthly task. I'm going to call 200 people, 400 people. I'm going to add 200 people, 400 people to my database. That could be a monthly task. Does everybody see where we're going? We'd make a list of what the monthly task would be just for the first month of our plan. Now, now that we have that, week one, what are we going to do? Well, put get our sphere of influence together. Right? I'm going to. That's a week one thing. I don't want to wait. I'm going to do it as soon as possible. Who's going to do that? Well. I'm going to do that because I want to go through and I want to look at the phone and I want to and I want to look at the spreadsheet when it's done and delete the people I don't like. All right, great. When? Now you was well week one. What, what, what do you mean when? Well, when I was I was in a coaching program for many years, and if I said to my coach, "I'm going to do it on this day," she'd say, "Oh, really? I'm looking at your calendar. I don't see any openings on that day." Uh, oh. Um, I guess I have to figure out which day I can do it, right? So that's time blocking. Well, all right, week one, Thursday, two o'clock, I'm going to block some time, an hour to do that. All right, great. What else are you going to do the first week? Well, I'm going to call at least 50 people that week, 10 people a day, five days a week. Great. Who's going to do that? Well, I've got to do it. When am I going to do it? I, you can leave it blank if it doesn't apply to that. It's going to be done by the end of the week. All right, great. Does everybody see where we're going? We're now breaking down the bigger picture into digestible chunks that we're going to do week by week. Now, we don't do week two until we get to week two. And the reason we don't do week two, and by that I mean fill it out until we get there, is because we have to reflect on what happened in week one. So in week one, I said I was going to get my sphere of influence together, export everything, get the LinkedIn people, everything. The question is, and this is where coaching would be involved, because the question is, if I were coaching you, I would ask, how did that go? How'd you do? And you might say, well, you know, things came up, the dog was sick, you know. There's this new series on Netflix. You know, I just didn't get to it. Okay, we have to move that over now to week two. You didn't do it week one. You got to do it week two. What else were your goals? Well, one of my goals was I was going to call 50 people during the week. Great. How did that go? Well, I only called 35. All right. You still want to reach the same income goals, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So week two... If your goal is to talk to 50 people every week, but you only talk to 35 the first week, it means we have to talk to 65 the second week because the deficit needs to be moved over to the next week. Huh? Huh? And then we allocate which of the tasks that we need to do to get to our monthly goal we're doing each of the four weeks, week three and week four, same thing, same form. Any questions about that idea? I bet you're all excited. Um, all right. So what didn't I do? In the folder I gave you, and I noticed somebody said, whose place? Well, they make t-shirts. Oh, that's not right. So what PLACE is, PLACE is the largest team in the United States. And if we went and looked at the list of the top teams, number one is PLACE. Number three is a company called Livian, which has been now purchased by PLACE. 
So I'm a place partner and agents can become place partners. And it's an operating system that goes on top of, let's say, EXP's platform or even could be other, you know, other, other brokerages. And what it is, one way to look at place, it's a white glove concierge system. So, for example, when you take a listing, there's 106 things that come up on the checklist that need to be done. Yeah, you don't think that's true? Where do you get a listing? And there's certain things like having the for sale sign ordered and put up on the property. At place, we would do that for you. We would pay for the sign, the for sale sign. We would pay to have somebody go put it up. You could look at you, you, you get the pictures, it goes into the MLS. We need to make marketing materials. The team, the place would make the marketing materials. They have people in a marketing department that would make the open house flyer, the just listed postcard, the social media post, all that stuff. You don't have to do any of that. All right? It would they would send it out, they would syndicate it. You don't have to do any of that. Angela, you can just jump in. I just wanted to say, uh, to be specific, we would uh, work with the agents and do 180 of your guys' tasks um, on your behalf. 100 so. or 180? 180. 180. Yeah, she, she's better at that part. So what, does everybody understand you could do all that too? You could be sitting there and making flyers and picking out which pictures and moving them around and looking for printers. and then. But you also would have to pay. You understand all of that is organized within the system. Place owns Land Voice, which is one of the largest database systems where for sale by owners expired circle prospecting. You have access to all that. There's no additional charge, et cetera. So do you have a minimum production? Um, you have to be a serious full-time or mostly full-time agent. You have to have a high commitment level, which means you have to be willing to do the things that are in the plan to do. And if you do what the which is fear of influence open houses and prospecting and you're getting business from that will match your transactions with transactions that are team generated so talk to me Deidre, if you if you're interested right if you're committed now you see i have a i have a big team um where not everybody is a place candidate because you know they're not committed or don't have enough time circle prospecting Circle prospecting is the idea that when, I'll tell you, old school, somebody lists their house, right? Whether the listing agent has thought of this or not, you would go knock on 10 doors each way on the left and the right of the house and 20 doors across the street, um, particularly if this is your broker. And you would knock on the door and you say, hi, my name is Mike. I'm a VXP Realty. We, we. Just listed the property down the street, you know, the Anderson's house, you know, you might be curious about what they listed it for and what's going on. Have you ever, how long have you lived here? When do you plan on selling your house? So circle prospecting is calling around in neighborhoods based upon recent activity to talk to people about, hey, did you hear that the property around the corner from you closed? Hey, did you know that in your neighborhood there were 20 sales last month? The value of your home has changed as a result of those 20 sales. Would you like to talk about how did it go up? Did it go down? And by how much? Are you interested in that? That's called circle prospect. Any other questions like that? All right. I don't know. Um, what else do I want to show you? So in the slides, I, for some EXP training, I don't know why that's, for some reason, I don't think I'm looking in the right. <laughs> I, I don't know. There seems to be things that I put here that don't belong here, but what can I do? So there is a place business plan, which is a spreadsheet. Let me share while we're still doing this. And we, I went through a little bit about budgeting and how to reach a certain profit, where what would be probably something that we would want to look at, and whether you use this form or come up with your own, 
the question is, what are you going to do? Right. And this is a little bit higher tech way of figuring it out. You can put in what your unit goal is, and it would tell you how many people you have to talk to based upon our our research, our, our analysis of how many calls result in appointments and appointments result in clients. And you could break it down so that you could identify these are the specific things. I'm going to do so many open houses. I'm going to make so many phone calls. I'm going to contact so many for sale by owners, etc. And then if you're only going to look at one thing on this, it would be this page, which is an agent business plan, which would allow you again, you can, you know, you make a copy of this, right? If you want this, you would go up to file and make a copy. You're not going to be allowed to, to modify the you know, what I've got, um, because then it would be ruined for everybody else. And you can put in units and income and all of that. And it's a place where you can identify what you're going to actually do. There we go. The other things that I put in here just to keep you busy. Why do I not know why that's there? I don't know why that's there. Um I seem to have extra things here. So this is uh, a version that I put together, which is, again, if you wanted to play with this, you'd go to file and make a copy. And in this, I gave I give an example what your income might be. If you're at EXP, you have a cap, $16,000. If you're on my team, it's only four. We would you could look at how much of your money is going to come from buyers and sellers. It gives you an opportunity to calculate on a not individual basis, but in a general basis, how many appointments do you need to get to where you want to be? And there's also a little section here where you can put in different kinds of expenses that you might have. The average real estate agent, you're thinking, oh, well, you get to keep all the money. She gets all that money. There are expenses, <laughs> right? A lot of them. And the, um, which is why sometimes being in the system where they pay for a lot of the expenses, so your gross and net are pretty close together is, is, is valuable. Um, anyhow, there's some other goodies in here, which I, for some reason, they're not... I know that this isn't all in the right one. I don't know. Um, I don't know. All right. There it is. That looks better. For some reason, uh, what I clicked on took me something else. All right. And winning the day, you can look at that. It's just sort of a breakdown of what you might do. I'm asked, what would a perfect week look like? What would a perfect day? My suggestion is at the end of all this, and I know I've, I've run out of time. I'm not, not surprised. But if you, if, um, my suggestion is that you use a calendar system. Those of you that try to get a hold of me will know. I mean, I call you back and I may be available, but the um, I'm heavily time blocked. It's sometimes not about selling real estate. It's about following a schedule. So we the this is the last drink of Kool-Aid. You create your 135. You create your overall business plan. You break it down into weekly things that you need to do, monthly and weekly objectives. And then the last thing is you time block for when you're going to do those things. If it's not in your calendar, it doesn't exist. It's not always about selling real estate. It's about following a schedule. It would be useful for you to color code the activities so that the ones that are the high producing activities, you might color in green for money and actually look at, well, how much of my time am I spending doing the things that require a real estate license for which I get paid versus the things that um, are really not that, you know, I don't need to, a license to do. Um, what it does my schedule, this would be a question you would ask yourself, 
reflect your goals? Does your schedule reflect your goals? Um, and then time block. Try to create patterns. Try to do more of the of things like lead generation in the morning. All right. How is that? Any questions? If you're on my team or not, and you want to be on my team, reach out to me. If you're interested in talking about the place system, reach out to us. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Um, if you're part of that group, then I would be coaching you through this process, right? Because it's not just that I made a plan and am I doing it? Do I have somebody to talk to? And that would be the coaching element that we would add in. All right. That's enough. Next week, we'll do something more fun. All right. Any Thank you, Michael. All right. Thank you. Thank you.